Hello everyone, welcome back to One Soccer. I'm your host today, Josh Deming, joined by my colleague Alex Gongay Ruzik, and we have plenty to discuss today. To give you guys just a little breakdown of how the stream is going to go, we are going to discuss the odds of Canada winning the uh, Copa America, or just kind of talk about the bracket as well, if they're able to make it out of the group stage. We will preview Canada's squad and maybe try to come up with the 23 players we think should go to the Copa America, talk about our matches against Argentina, Chile, and of course Peru, and what Canada will need to do to defeat them, what success will look like at the Copa America, and finally we will end with a coaching debate. You know, what coaches should we target? Will we have to wait till the tournament's over? Will we have to find a couple options before? Will we have yellow? And we will talk, of course, with the chat. So that is the schedule for today. Hopefully you guys are excited. If you are, say hello in the chat. And uh, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing well. Good to, to hop on uh, the stream, Josh. Always, uh, always a pleasure to, to be here. And yeah, definitely got a lot to talk about now that, like we mentioned uh, on our stream over the weekend, now that the Copa America is secure, you can start looking ahead finally to all these storylines, such as who's going to coach Canada, who's going to play for Canada, who's, you know, what are the odds Canada wins? Uh, what's Canada Argentina actually going to look like? Man, I can't wait. Cause the more I'm setting in on it, the more I'm researching Copa, just looking at the history of this tournament, over a hundred years of history, eight out of 10 South American teams have won it. So much fascinating uh, history that I'm excited for Canada to, to be a part of now. Absolutely. This is Canada's first ever appearance or will be Canada's first ever appearance at the Copa America. I'm very excited about it. I really tried to hold my tongue talking about the Copa America because I really didn't want to jinx anything. But now that we have qualified, I just feel like we can toss out as much content as we want to, which is why we have so much to discuss today. So guys, if you're joining us, like our friend here did, say hello. Get your guys' opinion, especially in for these uh, percentage odds, because that is where we are going to begin today. It is going to be with the odds that Canada goes on and wins. Now, we will get into what success looks like a little bit later. But right now, I want you to let me know in the comment section what do you think the odds are that Canada will win the Copa America? Because the odds were released, Alex. Uh, we will start, I guess, at the, at the bottom. Canada just snuck in that list right there with a 1%. Then it goes up to Peru at 2, Chile with 3, Ecuador with 5, which I think is a little low in Ecuador. Uh, US has 6, then it goes to Colombia at 6, which again, I think is a little low. Mexico at 8, which I think is a way too high. Uh, Uruguay's got 14, Brazil 25, and Argentina at 30, but I want to focus in on that little one percenter right there. So when you take a look at the odds, um, what, do you, what do you think there, Alex? Do you think that one percent uh, is just? Are you surprised you even made the list? Uh, yeah, it was a bit weird because I'm like, of all these names, like how is... It was like putting Canada ahead of a Venezuela is a bit bold. No, right? If you're Venezuela, you could feel a bit slighted by you know by that maybe you know paraguay i think paraguay could be very dangerous they've got a good team you know, miguel almiron will be will be leading the way um so i was a bit surprised to see one percent but i i think that's probably uh, maybe maybe let's just assume they round it up because i mean we can we can do the math on it uh it is definitely less than one percent if you look at the the odds that canada has of, of beating them but what I think is factored in here too, I have to remember, is, is groups. Because I think that's a big reason why Mexico is much higher than the US, because Mexico ended up getting a very favorable group draw where uh, they, you know, for them to, to get out of group B, they have Ecuador, Venezuela, Jamaica. Ecuador is definitely expected to win that group. But I think if you're Mexico, you back yourself against Venezuela and Jamaica. And then from there, their path um, to the to the knockout, like through the knockout rounds, is, is a little easier than, say, the US's might, right? Where the US has. They could end up paying a Brazil or a Colombia right away, which would, which would be a rough quarterfinal draw for the U.S. Should they make it out? So, bit of a weird odds, but maybe maybe that maybe they should have done a better job just explaining whatever uh, odds they used. It's a bit weird. No, that's fair, and we'll, we will get into that right now because that's a very good point. Uh, I got a couple percentages in. Let me know what odds you think Canada has for winning the Copa America. I'm surprised they even put us on the list at one percent, so we'll take it. We got uh, Jefferson saying four percent with a new coach, new spark. You never know. We have the coaching debate coming a little bit later. Uh, we got an old 0% there. No uh, no love. Um, then we got a nice question coming in from Benedict uh, over from uh, CPL. Uh, and he focuses on the CPL players saying, which current CPL players do you think are the closest to the national team? 
Um, looking at Cordova from York, good depth for the Copa America, and also touching on his recent history in Chile. Now, I went to one of York's uh, practices about a month ago, and Cordova stood out to me night and day. He is such a technically gifted player. He was so much fun to watch, even in training. Him and Mo, I was just up up top uh, looking over the training, and I had a smile on my face because those two are so much fun to watch. I think that's a really good shout. Um, and I would agree with you, Benedict. I'm just trying to think off the top of my head if there's a different role or a different position I could think of someone getting in, the, in there for. But I like the connection you made um, to his history in Chile. It's just, you know, he would probably be looking at that right wing back role. And then you have a, you know, a Tejan. Larea may obviously not be there, but then you have to sneak in like maybe an Ali Ahmed. I don't know. Alex, what's your initial reaction to that? And is there another CPL player that you think comes to mind um, who has the best opportunity to finally make the squad? Yeah, it'd be love. Uh, it'd be fun to see a Cordova like in the mix, right? Who knows? Maybe he he ends up making an extended roster, right? Like a free camp roster or something like that. At least gets considered. You know, I think the best odds are probably at a in goal. Maybe he, one of them ends up sneaking in as a third goalkeeper, um, depending on what the interest is like. I know, of course, Rayan Yesley is eligible um, for for multiple nations, but who knows? Maybe Rayan Yesley end up and if he has a ends up winning the net in Ottawa and has a fantastic start. Ottawa does well in the can champ. You never know, right? You never really um, do know. So I think it would be cool to, 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 to you know, eventually continue. Because we have to remember in 2019, there were CPL players in the, in the squad, like Amir yeah. Didich, Dominic Zator, Marco Carducci. And okay, maybe not all of them stuck around long-term, but it, it helps Zator. You, you know, he's eventually made it to, to, to the fringe of the squad. So... You, you, you never really do know because we'll see how the, the the next few months go. But uh, I, if I were to pick one, I'd go I'd go for a goalkeeper. Like yes. You gotta give me a goalkeeper though. I need I need one. Who do you think can just get in there for number three? Let's just say if uh, if Searwall for some reason you know isn't available or there's an injury, give me a keeper that you think is leading the way from the CPL. Oh, Yesley, hundred percent. Yesley, it is Yesley. Okay. Because just yeah, I think if he builds off what he showed in that last year, you know, it's a six foot seven keeper who's had MLS interest before. You know, it's, it's, it's not that unreasonable it's to imagine. It, it would be something where, yes, Ciro would need to drop out because I think Ciro is your number three. But who knows? Maybe he ends up staying with Montreal and you need a third keeper. And yes, he ends up being that guy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fair show, Benedict. I do like your show as well. Um, not not quite a CPL, but, you know, one, one for Plus, the future. Plus, yeah, one for the future. He keeps this, he keeps this up. He's going to be competing with Ciro. So, yeah, Canada always so... So, so deep in goal, uh, it's, it's a lot, a lot of names to keep an eye on. But all right, now we're going to move on to the bracket. This is the reason. So any, anyone who's just tuning into the chat, be sure to drop a like, say hello. We're talking about the probability of winning the Copa America and we've got the percentages here, but now we are going to roll on to the bracket. So I know this tweet got, you know, quite a bit of interest, especially within the Canadian circle, because we, you know, we made it on there. But there was a lot of debate around why Mexico is so high at 8%, considering they're in a pretty dark time I, I guess in their history especially after getting run over by the U.S. in the Nations League final but it's because of the bracket so I'm going to bring up the best pitcher I could find from the bracket so we can discuss it a little bit here uh, obviously this was a little ways ago because we know who qualified in those final spots it, it will be Canada and of course Costa Rica but this is the crossover and this is why Mexico has a pretty decent opportunity because if you take a look they could have a good if they can somehow find a way. The key is they have to find a way to top uh, Group B. They're going to be against Venezuela, Ecuador, Jamaica. If they find a way to top the group, they will then take on someone from Group A, which you know could be Chile, it could be Peru, it could be Canada. It gives them a pretty decent opportunity to make it to the semis. Where if they finish second in their group, they're against Argentina, and you know that is, is a t is a tough call. Uh, as for the U.S., no matter what they're playing, if, if they qualify in first or second, they'll get Colombia or Brazil. And I think that is very, very difficult. I think if you're Mexico and you're able to top your group, you would take, you know, hopefully take on one of the other three in Group A. Unfortunately for the U.S., as long as Colombia and Brazil top their uh, one, go one, two, that's a very difficult cross. And uh, personally, you know, just it's looking way ahead. I would put my money on Brazil or Colombia taking out the United States. I think the United States will in my prediction, get out of the out of Group C, but I think that cross is deadly, and unfortunately for them, I think that's probably where they're going to fall short. Alex, for the bracket in the side, and I guess looking at the Canadian side of things, if Canada can finish in the top two, they would probably 
probably. I mean, it's pretty close in Group B. But they could get an Ecuador. They could get a Mexico. I mean, Venezuela is doing fantastic right now in World Cup qualifying. I think Jamaica is a little bit too all over the place for me to really talk about them finishing in the top two. But let, what do you make of the cross? And if Canada is able to finish in second place, do you like their odds? It's 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 an interesting discussion because I think it's it's tough to gauge with Ecuador because Ecuador has looked so good. They've had a flying start to World Cup qualifying. They lost one nil to Argentina in Buenos Aires, which is first off like it's pretty pretty good. Like that, that's the loss you'll take. And then they went out and beat. Uruguay, they want to beat Bolivia. They drew Colombia, drew Venezuela, beat Chile so far. And despite having a points deduction, they're in a World Cup spot as it stands. Like Ecuador is a very good team, but funnily enough, they're them and Venezuela, the only two teams that have never won Copa America. So actually, I saw some interesting discourse yesterday being that people are like, oh, Ecuador's odds are too high. They always choke at Copa America. So there's actually a bit of pressure on. Ecuador at Copa America and Mexico, funnily enough, has a good history at this tournament. They've even made a final of the Copa America way back when, I think it was 2001. Um, so I think for, for Canada, the fact is this side, it's pretty much Argentina and it's a bunch of question marks. And I think for Canada, you'd rather have that. Whereas if I look at the other side, the US can, can be considered a favorite. They're at home and they're a good team. Uh, they're always much better at home. Uruguay, 100% of favorites. That team looks so good. Like, there's Valverde, you know, is going to lead the way. Nunez has had him off to a good... He's been one of the leading scorers in, in World Cup qualifying. They're going to be so tough. Brazil is always Brazil. Yes, they're not the same Brazil of 5, 10 years ago, but they still have a very good Brazil team. They showed it recently in a friendly against Spain. And Colombia, man. Col <laughs> Colombia has been quietly growing a lot. I think those are four favorites on that side, whereas you look at the, this side of the bracket... Argentina's a favorite. They're probably the tournament favorite. Um, but, but Peru's going through a bit of a rebuild. Chile is going through a bit of a rebuild. Mexico, we really, we really can't gauge Mexico. Because I was funny enough, the one thing that hurts them is they're so bad against the U.S. now. I think it's seven now that they've <laughs> like dropped to the U.S. They drew Germany last fall. They beat Ghana last year. Like the Mexico, for them, their psychological hurdle is the U.S. They had a good World Cup going up in a group against um uh, of course, Argentina, Poland, whatnot. They didn't make it out, but they they all, they were close to beating Argentina. I think if you're Mexico, you fancy the fact that you avoided Colombia, Uruguay, U.S. and 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 Brazil. And I think there's a there's a real shot if they can have a good competitive game against an Ecuador team that's young but has a lot to prove, which could could be could, could end up being a heavy load on their shoulders. I agree. I mean, and if you watch the Mexico game against Panama, Panama is one of the hotter teams as well in the region, and I thought Mexico handled them pretty pretty easily it's just they have a lot, there's a lot of history around the mexican national team there's a lot of expectations so the fact that whether they played well or not the fact that they didn't get out of the group in 2022 was looked at as a massive failure um you know i've seen a lot of pundits say this is the worst generation that they've ever seen out of, out of mexico but it's still they still still have some good players in there uh but i would i agree i would take if i was concaf i would want canada's group or i'd want mexico's group slash jamaica's group over where the u.s are sitting right now uh, it's going to be difficult. I mean, I am a biased Canadian and I would like to look at our group and say, you know, we got the we got the best one considering that um, uh, considering the other options. I just seeing what they did at the World Cup and basically the rough 2023 and even the very unconvincing win over Trinidad. I don't know. I don't know what to expect. I really don't. But we can get into that uh, a little bit later. Looks well, well, Sam, one thing to just hop on on that's yeah. interesting Look at the ELO ratings. I mean, it's tough. Again, there's no real good way to rank international teams because there's so much like fluidity. But I like the ELO ratings because it kind of gives an idea of who's been doing well the last two to three years. Right now, Argentina's ranked number one in the ELO ratings. As expected, you win a World Cup. Brazil's number three. I think that's not surprising. Colombia's number seven. So to that point about Colombia being a team to watch, they're seventh in the world ahead of teams like Belgium, Netherlands, Croatia, Germany. Uruguay is number eight. So that's to another point of how good um, Uruguay is rated. Ecuador is down in 14th, which is still very good. And that kind of goes to the point of what I was saying about Ecuador. Um, moving down the list here, Mexico's 22nd tied with the U.S., funnily enough, on ELO. So it kind of shows that other than the U.S. just beating up on Mexico, they're actually rated very similar on there. I think e the ELO ratings are um, based on the last two years of results or something like that. Um, then moving down... Um, to, to, to other teams. Peru's 32nd. 
Canada's now dropped to 39th. They were 36th last week. Chile's 40th, so Canada's one spot ahead of um, Chile. And then Panama's 42nd, Paraguay's 43rd, um, and, and so on and so forth. So again, a lot of the teams that I mentioned being lower are all on Canada's side, right? Like Peru, Canada, Chile are all in the 30s. Um, whereas, you know, Uruguay, Colombia, Brazil, all near the top, it does show that the other side of the bracket might end up being a little more uh, evil, at least on paper. That is fair. Uh, BC says Mexico got the easiest group. I don't I don't agree. I think out of the CONCACAF, I think Canada got the easiest group. Like I said, I mean, Chile and Peru are having a very difficult time right now. They, they you know, they are aging. Um, Peru's having a disastrous World Cup qualifying campaign. But we do need to move on now. Next up on um, our list for today is previewing Canada's squad. And I'm going to bring up a kind of starting 11, but then we're going to fill it in with subs. And we're just going to try to rapid fire some of the easier uh, players on here quickly, Alex, and then we will discuss some of the debates. So just to make it clear, I can only put on basically a, a two players on each position, but there will be three keepers. Unless Alex has any you know, arguments, I'm assuming it's going to be Crapo who will be our starter. It's Dane St. Clair, Jonathan Sirwaz are three keepers. I put them in the three, four, two, one position. Just it makes sense for some of the players that we put in here. But again, it's not a set system. So Alex, let's start at the back um, with our center backs. I would say, unless you have you disagree without, because Richie doesn't look like he's going to be in this tournament. Are you going to push Buchanan and Johnston as your like two right wing backs? Or do you think Johnston, after what we saw against Trinidad, will still be like the starting outside right center back and do you think bombita will be after that those are the two i had but do you have uh any other decisions for the outside right center back right now uh, so what hat do you want me to wear am i mr biello or am i uh am I uh, going for my natural uh, no no i think we i want to do biello because it, it's very difficult i tried coming up with my 23 i did it earlier today and i, I know alex will have some different opinion but i, I want your biello hat on because right now we know that biello it looks like will be there there's no guarantee, you know, maybe they find a different manager. I highly doubt it. So for right now, just to make it easy, be yellow hat on. What do you think he will do to outside right center backs? And let me know in the chat, guys, who would you do when I go through each position as well? And we can obviously discuss it. Well, it's Johnson Bambito, I think, for Biello. Yeah. We're going to go from that perspective. Does that mean Water Waterman Cornelius is your two centrals as yeah, well? Yeah, then it's probably Waterman Cornelius, and then it's probably Miller and let's, let's say Defugero. I think he's yep. continued to impress and shown you know uh, shown why he was deserving of a cap tie um because yeah i think there's definitely there's a lot of competition at the cb position i think it's going to be the one that's probably could look the most different by the opening game if that makes sense like you got mcnaughton um who just continues to knock on the door and you can't forget about him when scott kennedy's back healthy you can't you can't forget him at left center back too because he's just been out injured which is kind of why we haven't mentioned him is as much over the last few months. Heck, he, he, there's a bunch of guys in MLS who can make a push. You know, Kyle Hebert's battled an injury to start the year. You know, maybe he comes back with a bit of confidence and all of a sudden he's back in that mix. Like, it, it's something where there's definitely enough moving parts where I'd be pretty comfortable naming this six today, but maybe in a few weeks it ends up tweaking slightly. I think so as well. Very excited that Defusual looks to be in this squad. Um, I, I I think it's pretty straightforward. The one that, you know, does bother me is McNaughton. I think looking at his form and leading up until the Copa America, you know, I just, I feel like he's honestly battling with like those two central midfielders uh, or those two central center backs, Waterman, Cornelius. I just feel like they have the edge right now. Kamal Miller, Defusero is the outside left. I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we now move on to right wing back and we are speaking as if Larea is not going to be there because it seems like a very difficult injury to come back for I don't even know if the timeline would match up. I know it's three months. He got injured late March. So we're just going to assume for today's video that he's not available. He's got an injury. Um, so for me, Alex, I went with Tejon as the starting right wing back. Naturally, without Richie there, it's to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, I snuck Ali Ahmed in there. Now, I'm curious to see if you want to see him get pushed somehow in the middle and bring a different player or what other options you were looking at for right wing back. But we know that, you know, I, I want to get Ali in the squad. Uh, this is just, you know, to make it look easy here on paper. But I slotted him into the right wing back role. Doesn't mean he has to play there, but you'll see because there's different players in different positions. So do you have someone else in mind in the right wing back? Or do you think that's where we can, you know, put Ali because he could be used there? It's funny because there's so many names you could put there because Mathieu Schwanier played there yeah. <laughs> for Canada last week. 
Because with Ahmed, he's playing right wing back for the Whitecaps purely only defensively. That's the plan when he's fully healthy. It's for him in out of possession, the Whitecaps play very rigid 3 4 3. They want Ahmed to be one of the wing backs. But in possession, um, it looks like the plans to play him as more of an eight, more of a midfielder in possession. So I wonder if for Canada, where, you know, it's maybe they're not going to be defending in a rigid 3 4 3. It might make more sense for for him to be listed as a midfielder and Schwanier to be as a wing back. But I think either way, both Ahmed and Schwanier are in the squad. They both can play midfield. They can both play wing back. You can kind of interchange and not be really, you know, you can make an argument either way. Yep, I'll go go through gut though. Which one? Well, let's just put we'll put Schwanier because we saw Schwanier? Yellow play him there, right? Okay. And we've seen Ahmed play more in the midfield for Canada, so I think that. it's just knowing that we'll, we'll, we'll nope. stick with that for now. That's fair versatility. It's something the national team has always had. Uh, now we're going to roll on to left wing back Davies clear favorite. And I assume as long as he's healthy, Adekubi will be the backup left wing back. Uh, any, any arguments? I mean, like I said, we have the two attacking midfielder positions, which will kind of incorporate, you know, your wingers, maybe JD. We can kind of talk about that sliding down. Cause we saw it there. Um, cause I know everyone's going to be wondering where the mullet man is. So I, I would say maybe we keep him for that, but do you think it's going to be Davies and Adekubi for right now? You have to imagine if Adekubi's back, he's still got a big leadership role to play, still at a high level, I guess. Well, the only thing we'll see is how his recovery goes, because it's such a finicky knee injury, it sounds like, where it's like they really have had to manage his his minutes, and we'll see where he is in two, three months. But I imagine that Canada's, I mean, not Canada, the Whitecaps, they've been really planning to bring him back in the right way so that he's fully fit. So I'd, I'd put Adekubi. All right, for our midfielders, uh, Eustachio kind of as your DM, Kone as your CM. I guess you, like we mentioned Ahmed could be one of the other ones. And then is the other obvious one as a backup to Eustachio, Piet? Yeah, I think for now, Piet, he's, he's, his form has is, is deserved him the spot. It's um, because if we we're assuming Ahmed is, is listed in there. Um, it really is until someone proves that. To, that he, they, they can win that spot over Piet in, in that number six because it's like can a Victor Latoury have a strong end to the season and push in maybe but for now Piet continues to do very well at Montreal he's one of the leaders on this team and uh, I think because of that we, 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 see, uh, we see Piet stay in all right Alex we flew through this but it's because I think a lot of the debate is coming in the front three kind of positions. And like I said, there's no guarantee this is exactly how Bielo will play. It could be a five, like a five man midfield. Someone drops a little bit deeper, and like a little bit ahead of you, Stachio, Kone. Uh, then you play two strikers. I, I kind of liked after what I saw with David and the fact that Azoria wasn't even available. I kind of like the look of this three, four, two, one. Um, and like I said, just to make it easy today, when we trying to come up with the positions, I think like a Liam Miller can go into the, one of those um, attacking roles. So could a Schaffelberg, so could a Brim, so could a Russell Rowe. We've seen him play there a little bit for the crew. Uh, Corbiano could go in there as well. Someone that Alex really wants to see get a part of the national team and a question mark I put up for a while now. How can someone playing in La Liga, second best league in the world, in my opinion, not be part of your national team? So a lot of question marks there, Alex. So for me, I guess the two kind of tens... I'm going to put David in one for now, just because, again, we kind of saw him go there. And then I would say, whether you like it or not, I think Azorio could be one of the other ones. And then I would say Schaffelberg and Miller from my four. Um, tell me why maybe I'm wrong. Um, why you want Corbana? Who would you leave out? Do you think there's any way Azorio gets left out? Because I don't. Um, so take it away. Yeah, I mean, if we're, if we're again, we're wearing the Bielo hat. Maybe we yeah. can, maybe we can, after this tweak and see what we'd change. Tweak? Taking right. off the yellow hat, but yeah, I think putting on, uh, keeping that yellow perspective, you probably Azoria returns for that leadership. David Miller and Schaffelberg. I think Schaffelberg, someone that either if even from my perspective, I think he stays in just because he's shown that he can be dangerous enough that uh, in all games you can use him off a bench to stretch the game out and make something happen. And I think that's immensely valuable. And that. Deserves a, deserves a look. So, yeah, Schaffelberg, I feel like, has earned his way in it. I think it's telling that he got a big shift off the bench against TNT with the game at 1-0, which easily could have gone to some other players who were a bit more familiar with the, the team. It easily could have been a piet to lock things down. No, Biello trusted Schaffelberg to go out and stretch the game and was rewarded with a, a beautiful goal, and he could have had more. So I, I think that's probably pretty fair. And I think from there, the two last two striker spots kind of right themselves for Biello, which would probably be 
Hal Aaron, of course, and then uh, Ike Ubo. That's that's what I think. That's what I'm thinking too. Like I, I put this together pretty quick. I'm not gonna lie. When I did it earlier this morning, uh, I was expecting a little pushback from you. Just well, again, mostly yellow perspective. You want, you want pushback from me? Yeah, I'll, yeah, give yeah. All, I'll give you all sorts of pushback. <laughs> we can get, we can get into that. Um, no, okay, that's fair. Uh, I didn't think this would be the exact squad you would take, but like I said, I had my BLO hat on when I came up with this. I still wasn't sure if there's a couple spots maybe you would argue um, that should be there. But yeah, I guess mostly from a BLO perspective, this is this is pretty, like, I guess, I mean, if Lorea was in here, it would make things a little bit more difficult of a couple of different spots. Uh, but again, from what we've seen from Schaffelberg, from Miller, Ubo finding his way back in, I just, I feel like this kind of almost writes itself. I'd be surprised unless there's a, a massive turn of form for a couple players or some injuries if this isn't really close to what we see. But Alex, we have a couple minutes here, sort of, before we roll on. Um, just give me a couple tweaks very quickly that you would like to make, just to make it a little bit, a little interesting. Uh, Sloppy Joe says, good exercise. Tough on Bear, tough on Corbiano to miss out. It is, but like I said, I mean, looking from Biello and honestly, just from form, I, like it was easier to cut those players than anyone else that I kept. But now we're having Alex going to go in here and he's going to try to shake things up for us very quickly. I think the if we're going to shake things up, there's a few things. And I think the biggest thing is, is this the right formation, especially for a Copa America? Like, are, and I think that's kind of the big question is, okay, this 3-4-2-1 kind of builds itself when you're looking at that. But is it going to be wise to go out and play a 3-4-2-1 against Argentina? Is that the way to go forward tactically? I struggle to say yes. Ditto with Peru. Ditto with Chile. Ditto in just any of these big games. We've seen it that what you need to compete against top teams right now, you need you need to be solid at the back. Of course, I go without saying. You need you need a good midfield. Some some teams go three. Some teams go four. Right? It's something where uh, it feels like the midfield is as important as ever. And I think the million dollar question. It's going to be the one that yellow it's tough for him to figure out because we've seen Canada kind of bounce between it is can you get away with two strikers in a top level game you can get away with in CONCACAF 100% um when you're dominating you can have Laren and David like for example heck against Trinidad Canada had the luxury of basically Ugbo and Laren were struggling to find space but because Canada had so much of the ball Ugbo finally gets a look he sets up Laren they score you're not having that luxury against an Argentina where you might not see much of the ball. You can't really afford to just have two, three strikers on the pitch. You might barely see the ball. So that's where I think the big thing heading into Copa America, I just struggle to see a scenario where this formation will make sense. It's then it, it, leading up to with the Netherlands, that friendly, is it going to be wise to be going up against some of those guys they can employ playing a 3-4-2-1? So I do wonder if a 4-3-3 comes into play. So I think there... Yeah, you're going to have to cut some CBs off the roster. You're going to have to need more midfielders. And it's going to kind of tweak up the overall complexion of the of, of the squad. And I think that it all centers around a formation switch. And then, yeah, from there, you could talk about, I think, McNaughton could earn a push in, like we mentioned, Corbianu. Um, I think, you know, how Jaden Nelson starts the year can only be considered. And the wild card I'm throwing in just because Canada, until they find someone who can consistently deliver set pieces... Don't sleep on Junior Hoylet. I feel like that's something where, yeah, it's a bit of a bold, more veteran-based take, but I do wonder if someone like his his, his, his caliber of, of dead ball deliveries could be considered. If I was looking at just this roster and, and trying to find a way to bring in a, a Hoylet, I mean, I'd maybe leave out Azorio because you know, Hoylet can kind of play in that, that 10 a little bit as well. He can play um, in a wingback role. He can play, he's great on set pieces, like I said. But, um, but I, I agree, Alex. It's just so difficult to talk about playing in like a 4-3-3 when I have like, you know, zero hope that Biello would make that type of change leading into this tournament. But I mean, hey, if another manager comes in, that opens up the door completely, which is why, you know, the exercise, I guess, was golf of what Biello would do, which is why we find ourselves in this 3-4-2-1. Um, Ethan says I was a little concerned in transition as Davies and Buchanan stayed really high in that game. Uh, that It is concerning. It's just considering that it is Trinidad and Tobago. I feel like, you know, they... They had the ability to do it and kind of had a much less of a risk to getting burnt. Uh, there were still a couple of big chances for Trinidad. And like I said, it was far from a convincing matchup. I would hope that they wouldn't be naive enough 
um, under Biello or even themselves to get caught in that type of position against a team like an Argentina because it would be a very, very different approach. But I definitely agree. There was not a lot I liked about that Trinidad match, to be honest. We, I know we got the job done, but again, far from convincing. Uh, got a couple comments coming in saying Corbiano better than Miller. I don't think that's totally... Totally fair. Uh, we lift, we risk losing Corbiano to Romania, so he's already cap tied to Canada. He, uh, he he cannot go to Romania. And you said that Corbiano is in form and proving his worth, and he's playing in a more meaningful role than Miller. Um, unfortunately, none of that is true. Um, Corbiano is it does look good coming off the bench, and he scored a beautiful goal in Spain. But he is not a starter for them. He is an impact sub, and he's only came off the bench a couple times. Doesn't matter. It's still an incredible experience for him, and I'm and I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited to see him over in La Liga. But Liam Miller is having a great season in the championship. He's one of the most important players on Preston. He's scoring goals, getting assists. I think he'd be a very difficult player to cut from this side. Um, I do think, though, because of the injury that um, was reported on him before the Trinidad match, probably why we didn't see him. I don't know if we would have saw him over Schaffelberg, but I think the injury keeping Miller out gave Schaffelberg a massive opportunity to impress, which he did. And that's why Alex and I have, I mean, we have both in this roster, but I I feel like honestly, maybe in Biello's eyes, that I would, I'd even put Schaffelberg a little bit of, above Miller right now. Not really in terms of what they're exactly doing for their club, but for what Schaffelberg continues to do from Canada coming off the bench, he'd be a tough player to, uh, to keep off. But Alex, we're moving on to our next topic today, and that is how to beat Argentina, Chile, and Peru. So do you want to take the first crack at, Argentina. I just kind of touched on that how this Canadian side lined up a little differently against a uh, a, tr a Trinidad and Tobago. You know what I mean? Like it's very different of how they're going to approach Argentina. So from what you know about the defending Copa America champions and the defending World Cup champions, how is this one percent uh, Canada side going to get anything out of this side? And or, and if they do, how are they going to approach the game? Yeah, it's it's going to be that's the million dollar question that that you have to answer is how can you look competitive against Argentina? I guess what luxury is that maybe if you focus on Peru and Chile, the Argentina game will be a wash. You're expecting Argentina to finish top of the group with nine points, but also it's a tournament opener. It sets so much of a tone. You get a draw in your tournament opener, it changes. Imagine how much different Canada's tournament would have been if they drew Belgium instead of lost, right? It would have been night and day, just even a point. So. Yeah, it's really the, the million-dollar question. And the thing is, we haven't really seen many teams capable of doing it. But I think what the, the, the thing I'm kind of starting to realize is that maybe the answer is a lot different than we think. Because I think conventional wisdom is park the bus, you sit 11 players behind the ball, and you just pray, and you bunker, you hit the other way. The thing is, there's one reason, and that's part of the reason why Argentina is so dangerous, is they have one man who is anti-low block, and it is Lionel Andres Messi. He, he is just, you give him a low block, he thrives, because that just means he gets to walk around in the final third, find his space. You give him a shot from 30, as he got against Mexico at the World Cup, he'll beat you. You give him a shot from the edge of the D, like he, he did for Miami against Nashville in the League's Cup final, he'll punish you. You can't sit deep against Messi, you just can't, because either he'll break you down with some perfect pass, like he did against Australia, or against the Netherlands, or he'll, he'll, he'll break you down with the worldie. So I think for, 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 for Canada, it's going to be that, that uh, that's going to be such an interesting matchup is, because it feels like maybe the best way to, to, to go at it is actually a lot more aggressive. Yes, Argentina can also hurt you that way. And Heldi Maria can, it is still lethal in transition despite his age. We're seeing him continue to rake in the goals. Lotaro Martinez is always a very dangerous threat in behind. Alejandro Garnacho is starting to embed himself in the into the mix he's a, he's a dangerous wide threat but as we saw at the world cup what i found fascinating is this game he pulled up here saudi arabia because they kind of fucked conventional wisdom and won and if you watch the game it made no sense they were playing a high high line they weren't you know always sitting deep they were trying to play the offside trap it kind of threw argentina off because all of a sudden you play a high line you're asking messi to build from a little deeper you're not asking him to, to play in the final third as much and maybe that's maybe that's something where the secret to stopping Messi is again not stopping Messi. No one stops Messi, but it's maybe to move to, to keep Messi to certain areas of the pitch because Messi can kill you from deep. He's a great passer, but if you focus maybe on cutting off his supply like Saudi Arabia did with the offside trap, maybe that's the way to go. And all of a sudden uh, that could encourage 
guys like Bombito, because you can if you're gonna play an offside trap, you need speed, and then and, and that's where somewhere like a like a Bombito could all of a sudden be an asset we're not talking about. Now, as much as I want to keep talking about Argentina, Canada, because it's it's messy, it's Davies, it's one of the biggest matchups you'll see. Um actually we got one more question coming on. Messi is full of injuries and his way less fast than he was in PSG Barca. You need a good defense and Messi will not pass through. I think the biggest question mark is around this Canadian defense, Alex, if you're looking at the roster in general. If you're looking if you're looking at Argentina versus Canada and you're wondering where the weakness would be and if you're looking at either, you know, creating goals, uh, scoring goals, the midfield, the fullbacks, the the center backs, I feel like most people would say the CBs. Do you, do you think that's a fair point and can they handle someone like Messi? I'd say it's the CBs and it's also the midfield. I think you can make a double argument and that's another thing where Canada's midfield is going to need to be on point. I think you should probably go three because Argentina sometimes plays a four in midfield with DePaul, uh, you know, uh, McAllister, Enzo Fernandez, Messi kind of dropping in as a 10. The midfield as well is going to be just as, as important. But yeah, that defense is going to be massive. And I think for Canada especially, uh, the right personnel is going to be going to be very important because uh, uh, as we saw against Trinidad, that, that's that's crucial. And uh, yeah, I think the d- defense is definitely an area to hone in on. This is Copa America, baby. I want to see at least three yellow cards per game. Just bring McNaughton in and we win. Um, yeah, so we're going to move on. Uh, like I said, I want, to, I want I like talking about Argentina against... Uh, Canada because it's an exciting matchup. It's a huge opportunity for some of our players to play the defending world champions. It'll be great. But at the end of the day, I doubt this match will decide whether Canada goes through. It's the other two. And I brought up the Common Ball uh, World Cup qualifying standings right now. Um, sitting up here in first, we have Argentina, 5 and one But it's down here where I want to focus on. And a lot of uh, question marks were around why Canada is set up potentially for an upset to make it out of the group. And it's because of where Chile and Peru have been these past couple years. Uh, Peru didn't qualify for the last World Cup, neither did Chile. Uh, both of them are sitting towards the bottom of World Cup qualifying once again. Chile in eight, Peru in ten. And this is even having Ecuador with the points as a deduction like we talked about. This is the perfect opportunity for an upset. It's just like I said, at the same time, when you look at Canada and their performance at the World Cup, you know... There's nothing really there to show that they can do it in, in a big tournament like this. And like I said, we don't have Herdman anymore, a big part of us qualifying. We have Biello, so I think there's a lot of question marks really around all three nations. But you can't look at this fact. When I look at this roster, I'm like, out of those three teams, it's like Canada's got the starters. They got the David, the Davies, the Buchanan. They have players playing at a higher level than both Chile and Peru does. So take a stab at one first, Alex. Uh, which one do you think will... Which one do you think... If you're going to pick them, if you're not going to pick Canada, which one do you think would get out of the group, uh, Chile or Peru? And which one do you think is the biggest threat to Canada? I'd probably say Chile is giving me a bit more confidence than Peru at the moment. Um, I think Chile is a tournament team too. Like we have to remember this is a team that won the Copa America back to back in 2015 and 2016. They seem to relish this tournament. They've got enough experience so i think they'll be very frustrating to canada peru is the one where i think this is a statement game for canada i think as well peru their attack just look at the numbers there one goal right i mean of course paraguay only has one goal but their defense is good they've they've only allowed three they at least they're competitive in every game peru's got one and allowed eight and i think really what was really telling is because i was looking at peru this window they have nothing up front that's a huge concern for them in the country right now uh, that I've been seeing is that pretty much their main two striking options this camp, right? Were Gianluca Lapadula, 34, playing in Serie B, I think it is right now. Very good striker. I've liked watching him over the years, but he's 34. You know, he's, uh, it feels like he's starting to push the edge of his prime. He's the starter. The backup this camp was a 40 year old Paulo Guerrero, yeah. who's yeah, still getting called in. Like, I think if you're Canada, that's you're, you're, you're encouraged by that. And like, the thing is with Peru, there's who else? Because Raul Reed Diaz continues to be on the fringes of that team, but he's a guy who's also in his starting to push in his thirties. He's playing. He's, he's not even always starting for Seattle Sounders and MLS. Peru's attack is just the the big the big worry, and I think if you're Canada, you're fine with that because I think for for Canada, you match up well against teams 
that are a little weaker in the attack because Canada's attack can go up against anyone. We've seen it. They score. They scored. You know, they scored against a good Croatia defense. They scored against a good Moroccan defense. They've scored against the likes of the U.S., Mexico. They rarely get shut out anymore. This Canadian team can score goals. Davies, like you mentioned, Jonathan David, both of those guys would probably start for for Peru and, and Chile. Um, they would definitely start. Um, but, so, like, I think it's something where Peru's attack. That's that's encouraging if you're Canada because at least you can know defensively it's not the same challenge of you, everyone we mentioned on on Argentina. So I'm really targeting that Peru game. Is yes, they're going to be very tough defensively. Yes, they seem to step up for Copa Americas. They made the final in 2019, I think it was, and they're going to be a tough out. But I think if you're Canada, you'd rather match up against a weaker offensive team. Uh, and right now, Peru, until proven otherwise, the, there's there's some very very big question marks to have on their attack. Whereas this Chile team. They, they can score. They they scored two against France this window on a friendly. They, you know, defensively they they were a bit sloppy in, in that game, but they also showed that they, they're they're going to be a team that will frustrate and has areas where they can hurt teams. And both these countries have found success. And I say recently, but it's really not that recent in the Copa America, as Chile of course won in 2015 and they won in 2016, which was hosted in the United States. Peru, like you mentioned, Alex was the finalist in 2019 and had a good performance against brazil who ended up winning that tournament but i mean that is i mean the 2015 tournament that chile first won was nine years ago but they still have players from that team on today's team with bravo and net they have vargas they have sanchez they still have some talent as well they're you know they're a team who, who knows how to get it done in this type of tournament and be, considering that it is their tournament this is their home tournament both of them you, you know you can't really rule against that when you have a canadian side but Again, out of all the groups I would have wanted to get landed in, this is the one that gives me the most hope, just considering where both of those nations are right now. Argentina is obviously going to be difficult. I thought this was a very curious take, and I want to get your thoughts on it, Alex. No point to waste energy on against Argentina. Send a B team on, and then be fresh for the final two matches against Peru and Chile. Any chance we see that? Because again, this no, is the, no, I'll just say, team against Argentina. It's the defending... like, when, are, when are you going to play yeah. Argentina in the opening game of a Copa America? competitive match you play your best team like there's so much value that in a, in a in this in, the, in a new stack you're going up against a Messi, uh, a kone going up against a Messi. like there's so much value and i think you play your a team and you give it your best shot and you go from there right i think it's uh, and again if you get a point in that first game it, the first game really changes so much and it's something where if you wanted to pick i'd want the weakest opponent in the first game so you get those yeah. three points it's nicer to head into that third game knowing you can play for a draw to get through, play for a certain result. Whereas if you lose that first game, the likely outcome is you head into that third game needing a win. And that just is a psychological hurdle that can always be tough to overcome. I'm just going to touch on this question very, very quickly. Um, this is the Cold America. You know, you, I agree. Like I said, I, I, as a biased Canadian, I'm not like, I, I think Canada's going to have a very difficult time getting out of the group. Just at the end of the day, I, we are, we're going to talk about hope. We're going to talk about how they're going to do it. I think Canada is, despite having, I think they have a better team. And like you're saying, Canada only has Davies. No, they don't. They have players that are playing at a top, multiple players that are playing at a top level. You have someone playing at, um, you have Buchanan playing at Inter. You have Davies at Bayern. You have David at Lille. You have so much form spread across Europe, which I can't really say at that level that Peru or Chile do. So, I get your point, but again, they're they're the this is their tournament, and I think it's that's why it's hard for me to say. Yeah, I'm super confident Canada's going through. Well, I, I mean, to answer this question as well, again, I think that on paper is important to mention. We're only dissecting these matches on paper. We're only dissecting what we know about Davies, David. They would start for Peru and Chile on paper. I don't know if it's is that unfair to say. I I'd, I'd back that claim. Those are the sorts of things you can look at on paper. What's also you can't consider, and what we also kind of briefly touched on, you don't know how Peru is going to act. Because, yes, okay, maybe they're struggling. But for them, maybe they realize that if they have a strong Copa, they can turn around their World Cup qualifiers and get make the World Cup. What we don't know is for Chile, maybe they view this as a last dance for some of those older guys. Okay, we can go in. And those are the lessons that Canada is going to need to learn. That's what they learned at the World Cup. Because on, on paper... They, they 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 had a chance of at least being competitive at the World Cup, and they were. They went up. They went toe to toe with Belgium, Croatia, and Morocco, and they came up short. That's where they learned. Okay, yeah, they had some talent in some areas, but defensively, they lot, made a lot of mistakes against Belgium. They didn't take their chances. You know how the story goes. We're not gonna yep. rehash that. 
So I think what's what's going to be so tough to judge with this Canadian team is what these matches are actually going to look like. I think, again, on paper, if it's not unfair to say, look, the ELO ratings literally suggest it. You can take the ELO ratings with a grain of salt. You can be like, oh, it's numbers that don't tell you. The numbers say that based on the form over the last year, two years, and ELO ratings takes into account the level of other teams you're playing. It takes into account home or away. It thinks that Canada, Peru, and Chile are ranked pretty much evenly by the numbers. Is that true? We find out in this Copa America. That's where we're going to find out all the intangibles. So I think that's very important to remember in this discussion that, yes, we're going to approach it from that what we know on paper because we don't know what Canada versus Peru is going to look like. We just haven't seen that match. We don't know what an, an experienced Peru team was going to do to, uh, to to Canada. And I think that's, uh, you know, I don't think it's confident to look at it, to, to make some of the states we're, we're seeing when remembering that. Yeah, and he's, you know, the comment said that Davies is the only one we have. We have... You know, Eustachio, Johnston, Laren, David, Buchanan. We have a ton of talent. Just whether you can get it on the pitch, working in the right way against whatever opponent you're going up against. Like I said, that Trinidad and Tobago match was hard to watch. And the amount of talent we have on this Canadian side doesn't mean it's always going to get the job done. Uh, I'm very curious. And I think Peru and Chile will be a perfect opportunity to show where this national team is at. Whether it's Bielo, the one who's going to lead them, or, or someone else. But this is going to be very exciting, and if you are a Canadian fan, you are you should be excited. Like You should be more excited than I'm feeling right now, because at the end of the day, they, they could have a good realistic opportunity getting out, considering where the other two programs are. But it also wouldn't surprise me if you know Canada finished in the basement of this group. This is their first time ever at a Copa America. I know they have a ton of talent, but they've never been in the situation before, so we'll have to see the way that they handle it. So Alex, very quickly before we move on to the coaching debate, which I know will be a fun one here um, on stream, we just, a simple kind of question. Uh, what does success look like to you at this Copa America? Do you have, you know, wanting to get out of the group, good showing in the uh, in the tournament? Uh, what do you think our odds are of making it out of the group stage? Uh, I, I guess I'll begin quickly. Let you think about it. For me, considering how well Canada did leading up to the 2022 World Cup, where we were one of the most informed nations heading into that tournament, I think we got very unlucky with the group we were placed in. Like a great example is I was looking at the United States. I would have took their group in a heartbeat we had two nations that went to the semifinals and the other one was belgium uh i thought there were some really good moments in it uh but it just showed the gap in the level when you're playing on the world's biggest stage and canada had a muffin <laughs> zero wins zero draw three losses we bounced out and had a really difficult 2023 to follow that so that's why i said without you know a, like i don't think a head coach who's in right now who's going to be there for the long term i don't know if bl has what it takes to compete at a tournament like this but i do think there's a lot of talent in this side and who knows you know big players they like to show up on big occasions and this is the first copa america who knows what kind of performance we're going to get out of those players we touched on like a davies david buchanan i would like to just see them show that they deserve to be here i would like to see a good competitive matchup against argentina a one two goal kind of game create some chances show that they can play with the best of them i'm not expecting them to get anything from that result but i want to see them start their A team and show that they're in it. And then I want to see them get something from one of these other results. I don't want to see us go pointless. I would ideally like to see a win. Even if we went 1-0 and 2, that'd be great. Or I picked up a couple draws. I want to show that we can compete against the likes of a Peru and Chile in their own tournament and show that we deserve to be here. Uh, I think if we make it to the knockouts and make it to the round of 16, that is icing on the cake. That would exceed my expectations. Just because I'm so hit or miss, because I think we have a good enough squad. I just don't know if we're in the right moment to do something in this tournament. So for me, it's just competing and hopefully getting some type of results. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I think to kind of continue that idea of the results, I just want to see, yeah, Canada bring 110%, bring some consistency. I think that's also something that's kind of been lost over the last year with Canada is that they haven't been as consistent as they can be. And I think that's what's so interesting with this, this discussion to kind of continue talking about Chile and Peru. What's funny about Chile and Peru is that on paper, we have no idea what this team's going to look like. Peru looks old. Chile looks a little older. What are they going to look like? What do I know about Peru and Chile? They're going to bring 110%. And that's sometimes the difference between comparable qualifying that I notice when I watch a lot of it is that no matter what moment any of these teams in, even if I'm watching Bolivia, Brazil, these teams always give 110, 115%. And that's what's so special about them that even if one of the teams is in a bit of a low era versus a team in the golden era. They're always bringing their absolute best 
um, to a tournament. I think for Canada and CONCACAF, we've kind of seen that slip because against TNT, could you say that was their 110% performance? It's what, maybe a 60% performance? You get away with it in CONCACAF. You can't. You don't. You don't need to be 110 percent in a game like that and win. And I think that's that's going to be the challenge for all the CONCACAF teams too. For US, Mexico was the US 110 percent against Jamaica. No, that felt like a 40, 50 percent performance. And we've seen that from Mexico. I think that's going to be the one thing I want to see from Canada. I want to see them be consistent across all three games. Just bring that 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 mentality because I think that's again where really the difference is between Conmebol and Concacaf is the mentality of these teams that they just have this desire this will to 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 win at all costs and for for teams in Concacaf they sometimes they they don't always have that so if I want to see that I would love to see Canada win a game I think that would be huge to win a game at a major tournament I think it would really be a big confidence booster because at the end of the day these are three good teams so if you're winning any one of those three I think you could be really pleased and i want to see this canadian team bring an identity because i think that it feels like for a while this canadian team we don't if i was going to ask you josh what would you say this canadian team's identity is like we know what they're good at on paper but what's their identity are they going to be a team that presses you high up the pitch are they going to be a team that's organized in the middle are they going to be a team that defends first are they going to be a team that wants to play with more possession it's hard to sell it's hard to tell what their identity is. So I'd say also bring an identity to this sort of tournament and build from it. I think this would be a good time to to to, to, to find that. And so yeah, those are the big things. So I think on paper, this Canadian team should absolutely be competitive. I think in an ideal world where they're at their 110%, like I mentioned, we're heading into this tournament really like, I'm not saying they're confident of qualifying, but it would be like, yes, they have a very good chance. Right now, I think we're saying they're kind of at that one, uh, that lower chance, just because we genuinely don't know what version of Canada we're going to see. So I'd love to see them bring an identity, bring that that effort, because if they bring those sorts of things, talent, talent will take them places. Now they just feels like they need those intangibles, chemistry, all those sorts of things that they're they're, they're still building. It feels like right. So I want, I want to pick up on that very very quickly, uh, just because, like you said, I mean, I've seen throughout World Cup qualifying, John Herman to me seemed like a a master around what he wanted his team to do against the opponent. And I think a great example of that was that two nothing win against the United States at Tim Hortons field. We were the home team. We were flying in qualifiers. I believe we had like 30% possession in that game. Very a different approach to what we've done in other, other uh, matches throughout that tournament where we wanted more of the ball. So like you said, more of an identity. So I just want to know from, from, from what you think against so assuming Biello is behind um, this national team in this tournament, and you want to see a bit of an identity, maybe a similar type of matchup. I know approaching Chile and Peru will be different than Argentina. But I guess the one consistent with this national team is that they have exceptional pace and exceptional wingbacks. Are you expecting a defensive structure hit on the break for all three matches? Or do you think we could see something like we saw in qualifiers where the Argentina approach is just completely drastically different? Maybe they sit with 30% of the ball and then they go and get you know, 60% of the ball against the other two? Or do you think that they more than likely in this tournament, because they're they're new and they're playing nations they never played, will sit behind the ball more so and then use that pace on the break? Is that the identity you're probably going to see this national team fall into? Or do you think that we could see someone else? It's tough. It's tough. It's genuinely, I, it's a boring, because I think of the World Cup, because what would have been the logic would have been to sit a little deeper and Canada went really aggressive against Belgium. So yeah, I think the, the reality is we just haven't seen enough of this Canadian team because they really like to play in possession. They really want to be those things. We've struggled at it lately. Um, so if I were to say I'd, I'd want Canada to kind of find a good balance, I really would want them to A, play to their strengths. That's wide areas. Like I want them to get the most out of Davies, Buchanan, Miller, Schaffelberg, they bring Corbianu, get the most out of Corbianu, because I think they have that strength in wide areas that they haven't shown a lot lately. Like against Trinidad and Tobago, the, there was so much space for them to dominate the flanks, and they didn't. I'd, I'd like to see them really do well there. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to see them defensively just be, be organized, be committed, um, play maybe a little more aggressively. Because I, I think if they can play a mid to higher block, that will require playing, you know, certain defensive players with certain profiles, maybe playing more of a true six. I'd also like to to, to see them that, but I just like them to have an identity because I think there's enough variety on this team where, okay, you want to be a team that is a little more midfield heavy, that's a little bit more in possession. 
I'd trust a midfield three of, of Ustakio Kone and like an Ahmed or Schwanier. Those are all guys that are good on the ball. You could build a team around more of a mid middle heavy identity, but of course you have Davies. You need to make sure he's involved. Buchanan. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe it's something where it's a bit of a hybrid where sometimes you see teams do this now where the middle opens up space for the flanks because teams know that you're good in the middle. They naturally collapse. It opens up space in the, in, in the flank. So I'd love to see a bit more, uh, variety that who knows maybe building around Kone in the midfield and his ability to control the tempo of a game is what a Davies and Buchanan need to open up space out wide right absolutely we will find out shortly uh, but my our final topic for today in a perfect transition from this question who do you think is a realistic coach that could bring in um, to get this team the identity that we're basically looking for and that was kind of where we're going for our next topic as it is who is going to be Canada's new coach and what is next for Canada. We have a few options for you guys because there is three coaches that I just don't think are, I know pretty much won't be available until after the Copa America slash Olympics. Uh, two of them are coaching the French women and the French men. One is coaching Panama. So Alex, I'll throw it over to you very quickly here to uh, touch on those ones, but um we're going to do it very quickly just because these guys aren't available until after the Olympics. So mainly these, these will be managers that could come in and be able to get the Copa America and then they could be a potential leading up to the 2026 World Cup. But we have a few other interesting names on the on this list that maybe as long as Canada can move quickly, get them in just before the Copa America and then would obviously give them the World Cup. So you, you know the three I'm talking about, the two French managers and Panama. So Go through them very quickly, Alex, and then throw it back to me, and we will get into some other managers. Yeah, well, I said it's Cherry Henry, men's coach of France, Olympics team, the U23s. You got Hervé Renard, women's coach, and you have Thomas Christensen of Panama. I think those are all three good options for different reasons. With Henri, I think you get something where tactically, Henri will have to prove himself. For what it's worth, he's very sharp tactically. I think that's no doubt. He's a smart player watches punditry for cbs he always makes great tactical points but always feels like for him the big thing is okay can he act how how, how much buy-in does he get from the players does he understand the strengths because i was sometimes uh, uh, always a question at montreal when he coached there but at least with Henri, you're getting buy-in because like if you're not respecting cherry Henri as a coach like what, what's going on here um as a player Hervé Renard is an interesting one because he he just gets players so committed to what he wants to do as an idea. As you've seen it with the French woman, you've seen it with Saudi men, you've seen it with all the you know the times he was he was the master of Afcon in the 2010s, the likes of Ivory Coast and whatnot. Like he really he really gets his teams bought in and committed. Maybe that's what Canada needs a bit more defensively. And Thomas Christensen, he just has Panama playing fun soccer. But unfortunately, yeah, it might not be worth it because the way I see it is. This Copa America is directly tied into the World Cup. Like, if I think if you win a game at this Copa America, your odds of winning a game at the World Cup helps. Like, this is a two-year cycle where this, these players are going to benefit massively from this. Coaching, you're going to benefit massively uh, from this. The, like, there's, there's so much benefit from this that I think ideally you'd like whatever coach you have at Copa America to be your World Cup coach. And I just think while Henri, Renard, and Christensen would be good names to consider, if they're not available till after this Copa. I'd probably have to remove them from, from the running for this two-year cycle. It's weird because I don't think we will make a coaching change. I like my gut, and again, my, my gut means nothing, but I just have a feeling that for some reason that Biello will stick to the Copa America, which is maybe why I don't feel like we're going to do very well at the Copa America. And then after that, I feel like we'll, we'll make a decision leading up to the World Cup that we are co-hosting. But I don't know. I, we have some other options we will discuss here, but I agree with your point, Alex. I would ideally like the manager to come in now that we qualified bring an identity, get familiar with the squad, take them to two major tournaments. Fantastic. Uh, out of those three, I'll just touch on Thierry Henry very quickly because, you know, he's got the connection to Canada coaching Montreal. Um, he also would be huge for dual Nats. We know how many dual Nats are scattered out there right now. Um, some important ones for our future. I think having someone like him could come in, but I'm also not overly uh, convinced um, of, of his history, um, his coaching history right now. Uh, I think a lot... I'll learn from this upcoming Olympics. Cause like, if, for example, he comes in and has a fantastic Olympic performance. Maybe that will get more interest and he, he doesn't want Canada at the end of the day. I don't know, but regardless, uh, we're going to move on to some, um, coaches that are available now. Uh, Armin threw a few up here for us. Um, 
we're going to touch on them <laughs> just for half a second because Jose Mourinho, uh, Car Carlo Ancelotti, I just don't think there's any way. Um, I don't, and Mourinho was teasing the idea that he wanted to come back and coach uh, a national team job. I do think is probably in his future at some point. I just don't think it's gonna, going to be in Canada. Unfortunately, Ancelotti, I don't really see that as well. But there's a couple other um, coaches out there. One that Alex and I have discussed for a very, very long time, Wilfred Nancy. Uh, there's some Southampton interest that has been reported. Um, I, again, I just I feel like if English sides are coming to look at him and the incredible job he's done with the crew, I don't feel like now is the time to really get out of club football. I think that he deserves interest coming from England and whatever his next move will be, in my opinion, will stay in the club side. Uh, and then the other interesting name, uh, we have Graham Potter and Jesse Marsh. So... Alex, you can pick up on Wilfred Doncy if you think there's any chance that, you know, Canada could get him. But the other two are available, could start tomorrow, and both have decent track records where they found some success as well as some failures. So uh, touch on uh, Wilfred Doncy for me because I know that you and I adore him. But at the end of the day, I just, you know, I doubt he's available. Well, I think for Nancy and Mourinho, I think you should you should call them. You, you know, should call them. <laughs> I think for Nancy, I think it's <laughs> unlikely because I think for his sake, it might be better to have another really strong year with the crew. I think he'll have all doors open. He's, of course, got a Canadian passport, but he's also got a French passport. At the very least, I could see him in Liga if, if he has another strong year with the, the crew. So I think if you're, you're Nancy, keep the doors open. But if you're Canada, call because you never know. That's why it's really tough to gauge with this Copa America World Cup. Like, it's such a unique job. How many teams in the world are guaranteed a Copa and a World Cup? The World Cup's at home. That's such a unique job that's open, right? Like, Mexico and U.S. don't have it. There's, Mexico seems to be sticking with Lozano and, uh, you know, U.S. sticking with Greg Berhalter. It's, it's so unique that in a situation like this, there is a coaching hire. Of course, we've got to know what the budget is because that's really a big factor with the Jose Mourinho is... How much budget would he really willing to take? What how much budget this can't have to throw? But uh, you know, I'd say you, you give him a call and see see where it goes. But I'm curious to see some of those other names because a guy like Mourinho, you know, he's gonna have the pick of his clubs or his, his countries. It feels like people are gonna want Mourinho. Make of what you will for him. He's, he's forever a tournament specialist. He continued to prove it with Roma. Yeah, well, maybe these days he's not the same effect in league play as he used to. He's you know, you know, but he's still a very sharp tournament manager. He can win these sorts of competitions. It'll be valuable for a national team. And I think his ability to manage personalities would be massive for any national team. But I wonder if like a Graham Potter, another name I, I found interesting, for example, is an Antonio Conte. Two very big levels of name, but with both of them, Potter has been out of a job since April of 2023 and Conte has been out of a job since March of 2023. The fact that they've both been out of jobs so long, they're very different managers, of course. Potter, more of a possession based. You know, he really came on the scene with, with, with Brighton that, that way. He wants to play very fluid soccer. So you could wonder is that right for Canada to go in that direction? Or is Conte, as we see, what are what are Conte teams always going to be from his Juventus to his Inter to his Chelsea to his Tottenham? They're going to be very defensively organized. And he likes a back three. Canada likes a back three and they want to be more defensively organized. Could a Conte be convinced to, to 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 coach a Canada again? It's something where I think it's it's a little it's again it's bold to think that guys like that would come, but I think those sort of managers could be interesting target because it's both been 12 months since they've had jobs. Could they be starting to think like, oh yeah, it's been a year since I've been in the club game. Maybe if a Canada gives me this two-year option to be a Copa America coach, be a World Cup coach, if I do well with Canada, put them on the map, maybe it'll put me in the in the the window for other jobs. I wonder if a Potter or Conte could be realistic. I I will pick up on that. Um, first off, with the fact that I do think this is a very appealing job. Like you mentioned, not only do we get the Copa America, which is, you know, and we have a favorable group. Because, you know, you, you don't want to accept these jobs come in here and you're set up for failure. You know, if hypothetically you took over Canada and ahead of the 2022 World Cup, you look at that group and be like, mm, that's tough. I think if you looked at the group that we are playing at the Copa America, you could back yourself to maybe get a result, which, you know, boosts your stock, looking from the coach's perspective. On top of that, co-hosting a World Cup is very, very unique. Canada is, you know, 
great country to live. And this is the best generation we've ever had hands down with all the players and talent we have across in Europe, as well as even at home in Major League Soccer, a league that's growing well. It, it could and plus with the expanded world cup you have and you're that you're a host you also have a good opportunity to get a favorable draw and get out of that group which again sets the manager up to do something special with this program i 100 agree i don't know if an antonio conte or a Mourinho or ancelotti are realistic i don't think that they are i don't think i think that they have egos that would back themselves to want to take on a different challenge something that almost guarantees them success instead of taking the underdog and hoping for success in my opinion, but I do think someone like a Graham Potter or a Jesse Marsh, this is intriguing because, and mainly because they had, they both found success in different ways at clubs, like you mentioned with Brighton and Salzburg for Jesse Marsh, and then they had very difficult spells. Jesse Marsh, you know, with his Leipzig spell was a disaster. Uh, Potter with Chelsea was a disaster, and they've basically been unemployed for a while. I think both, if they're looking a route back into coaching football, this could be in intriguing for both of them. There's not a lot, like, you know, there's not a lot to look at. If they get the opportunity to get on both these tournaments with the talent that they have, I don't see a reason why both, you know, wouldn't want it. I mean, it's not that it matters a lot. Both speak English, you know, that that helps. One being in, from England, one being from the United States. And Alex, I know you listened to a little bit of this too, so I just want to get your very quick take on it. But Jesse Marsh is also stirring up some, uh, some issues over in the U.S. Um, you said that you have a little bit more context of what I heard, but I know that Jesse Marsh was... I think questioning Gio Reyna. Uh, I think there's a couple shots taken back and forth with Greg. I just remember looking on X and seeing a lot of the U.S. men's national team fans, you know, saying this is why Jesse will never manage the U.S. men's national team. Um, you know, keep him away. I think that makes me like him a lot more if he ever took on the ca Canadian job. But uh, what did you make of those comments? And if you had to pick between the two, Jesse Marsh or Graham Potter, which one do you personally think would be a better fit? Yeah, Marsh is an interesting candidate because he's been, he's been making pot shots. It's no secret that he, he applied for the U.S. job. I think the day before Greg Berhalter was rehired, his agent tweeted out that Jesse Marsh would not be hired. So it kind of showed that even that his agent had to tweet that showed that he was in the running and was considered. And clearly there's been a bit of weird stick going on between Berhalter and Marsh. Look, if you want to get that anger out, it could be a good way to coach Canada. Uh, it's... It, for, for Marsh, the one thing that I'd have to see is, can he adapt his game from the club level? Because that's just the one thing that I've seen from at the club level is his game is very specific. It's that like Red Bulls, Gagan pressing, very aggressive. And as we saw, it worked to great success at a Salzburg. You know, it worked very well at the Red Bulls in, in, in New York. But then he went to Leipzig and it kind of struggled to, to find its feet. He went to Leeds, a relegation candidate, and it just, it, it, it you know, it worked the first year when he... They stayed up barely, but then the second year just wasn't working. Could he adapt that to the to the international level where I don't think he'll be able to employ a style like that because you got guys who are coming in exhausted all the time from their clubs. Like, all right, press. Like, we're going to – like, I just don't think that's going to work. So could he show enough tactically to, to to prove that? We haven't seen a whole lot from him. So that's why it's, it's a gray zone with Marshall. I think he knows the game well enough. He's familiar with Canada. He's coached here in Montreal, of course. Um, like he's obviously followed the league very closely and I think he what's really nice with Marsh is his man management I think you saw it in like for example in Austria they loved him because he learned German right away and was already able to communicate with some of the players if I'm not mistaken he was there right when Holland was there like he caught the end of I Holland and, so so like he, he, he showed that he can work with some good players learn the languages and I think that'll be good for for Canada but also I think tactically there'd be some huge questions. Whereas Potter, funny enough, I feel like it's the opposite. Potter's tactics have proven, I really like the way he sees the game tactically and what he was trying to do. But with Chelsea, he kind of struggled to impose himself on a on, on that squad. And for Canada, you kind of wondered what do they need at that at this moment? And, but also that's kind of that frames nicely into the discussion about yellow. Cause I didn't I think there is an interesting question we should probably also finish off with. Um uh, yeah, because obviously Sofiani put in, oh. put in a few um, comments uh, here as well on on uh, Mauro Biello. But I think uh, the question is also isn't so much what coaches bring to the table, but what does Canada need out of a coach? And I think that's something that is very important to have in the discussion about Mauro Biello and all the names we mentioned. 
Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I do want to. I, I think that the really intelligent point you had, though, Alex, around uh, Jesse Marsh, um, doing that style almost requires like you know training every single day, trying to implement something like that. It's. I feel like that style would be really, really difficult on uh, at the international level. And I don't even know how it would look, but like you said, he is intelligent. I, you'd have to imagine he would change, the, you know, his philosophy a little bit to try to adapt to a national team. But would it work? Do you want to take that risk leading up in front of two major tournaments? That's for me out of that debate. I, that's why I would maybe le lean towards a Grand Potter. If we got a Grand Potter, I'd be on Cloud9. I think that would be a fantastic hire. There are a lot of options there. And yeah, and as for Biello, why can't he lead the way for Copa America? Like, again, with, with absolutely no disrespect towards Biello, I just think right now this program, with all the talent that we have, with two these two major, major tournaments coming up, I want someone who... I think is ready for this job and i just from what i've seen from biello i don't know if that's him even off the last game against trinidad and tobago i mean he you know not being able to get through jamaica was tough um i look at the players and maybe even a little bit more than i, I did it in biello but i mean there's some really questionable substitutions he did and then the, tr the trinidad match gave me no confidence really despite getting the result going into this tournament i think that there's a but, you know, there's better and bigger fish out there that we could target and hopefully get them in for this very important cycle for not only the players and the pool that we have, but also for the fans. This is an opportunity to bring in a ton of interest ahead of a Copa America, try to ride that into a, a World Cup that we are co-hosting, that we can go see in our backyard. And I just want the best in the business if we can get that. And I don't know, you know, what profile is interested in the job and what we can afford and what we can get. But I have to imagine that there's a good fit out there, and I'd like to see it. I like to see them brought in before this Copa America. Although, if you're asking me right now, I don't think that they are. I do think Biello will get the uh, job at the Copa America, and maybe if he does something at the Copa America, it could change my mind a little bit. But for right now, if you're asking me, I would hope that we find a new manager sooner rather than later. So, Alex, last point on that before we wrap up the stream. No, yeah, I think it's definitely uh, something I want to mention just because I think it's an important discussion that. There is so much talk of new manager, new manager, new manager, but it's not necessarily what what's wrong with what's in place. What could Mauro Biello like? It's it, it's a lot of just looking at why Canada needs new faces, but then versus okay, Mauro Biello is the interim right now. What do we know about Mauro Biello? I agree that we should that Canada should probably be looking at a new manager here, but I think for Mauro Biello, I think the reality is it's just it's what he brings to the table isn't necessarily what Canada needs. And I think that's what's important to remember in this discussion, because I think what we've seen with Biello, I think we also have to commend him for it. Cause we also like, we can't forget that he also picked up the team in October. First off, after they didn't play any friendlies in September, which couldn't have hurt, like would have only helped him the very popular, at least, you know, for, <laughs> we, we, we know for the four or five years, uh, he was very popular or maybe how it ended, We'll, we'll see, maybe hear more in the next few years. The very popular John Herdman leaves. That's not an easy void to come in. Any manager, like, oh yeah, we're replacing a, a guy like John Herdman. And I think the fact that Mauro Biello came into that and he, he kept a lot of veterans on his side, then as soon as the veterans failed to perform for him, he, he makes the tough decision to cut most of them for this camp. And the, gr the group harmony looked very good. Uh, everything looked, you know, fine and dandy. I think that that des deserves credit. I think that shows that Biello as a man manager is a lot, you know, get, he did well in a way that I don't think we've seen him get a lot of credit for, which I think is important to note. But I think the flip side, and this is where I'm at, I don't think Canada needs that right now. I think what we saw, what they did so much under four and five years of, of John Herman was fixing the culture. Fixing, like he mentioned, his first camp in 2018, there was like four cliques. Everyone was fighting each other. He didn't like that. He wanted to clean it up. He wanted to change the culture. Now there, there, there's a culture there where you know kind of who the big guns are. There's a good, uh, uh, you know, there's a good camaraderie. There's got le leaders stepping up. Guys like Stefano Stacchio ends up wearing the armband. Alfonso Davies doesn't care. He just puts his head down and plays his game. I think right now the culture is in a good place where Canada really needs to take that next step ahead of 2026 is tactically and it's in their, their squad selection. And I think, unfortunately, Biello's brought more of the same. I don't blame him because maybe that's something where he didn't want to rock the boat. But I think this would have been his chance to prove that he could bring something different. For example, you got throttled against Japan, playing veterans, playing the same way. There was nothing stopping you from in that friendly, changing things up, mixing things up, putting in a younger roster and experimenting. And I think if 
fact that BLO has brought more of the same tactically across four games, especially in this Trinidad uh, game, I think that's where his, his downfall is. So I think it's important to mention that BLO at this moment, I don't think he's what this Canadian team needs. Uh, but I think, yeah, you can't discount what he brings as a coach. I just think he, he would have been a great fit in 2018, 2019. That's why he was part of the staff. But what this team needs is someone who's a bit, who brings different ideas tactically while still being a good man manager. And that's why when looking at some of those names, we've mentioned Wilfred Nancy is immediately springs up to the list. He's an excellent man manager, great tactician. Why Graham Potter interests me on the tactic side. We'll have to see how he is as a man manager. Why Jesse Marsh interests me on the man manager side. And we'd have to see tactically, but, uh, I, but then, then again, maybe Marsh falls into more of the Biello spectrum. Maybe that's why someone like a Potter ends up being a bit more attractive than a Marsh or, or a Biello. All good points. And if you know Alex, you know he is just begging for the uh, a manager to come in and play a 4-3-3. So that is uh, part of the part of the reason behind there. But it's all good points. And I will say, because I feel like we've been a little some, somewhat harsh on Biello, um, I, I did really like the fact that he changed things up. I think changing of the guard was important. Herman refused to do it. Biello initially refused to do it. Um, I love what he did. It's just like he, Alex said on the field, it just didn't go exactly the way I was hoping for. And yeah, we'll have to wait and see guys, but thank you for tuning in for today's stream. Uh, if you guys enjoyed this, as always, be sure to drop a like, drop a sub. A ton of content is coming up here on One Soccer, so keep an eye on the channel and we will see you guys soon. Cheers, friends.